So good day, everybody, um, and uh, greetings from the UN in Geneva. Um, happy to present today this uh, this study that I've been doing with with a lot of help uh, along the, the the past years. So the study uh, finds that they there may be a way for countries to regulate um, to regulate uh, cannabis, non-medical cannabis, and potentially uh, no, the the non-medical use of other drugs as well, but I have been focusing on cannabis in this particular study. Cannabis has a special um, legal regime in the single convention, and that deserves a specific attention. I believe uh, most uh, drugs uh, would deserve this specific inquiry, uh, specific attention given to their particular um, a treaty history and the specific legal framework that might apply to their non-medical use. And in particular, it relates to uh, the, 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 the possibility, uh, the ability, the existence of ways to uh, actually reduce the harms from the substances that we want to uh, regulate for non-medical use. So I'm going to try to present this briefly. I invite you to read the, the study. It's quite uh, long and dense in its international law, so it's always a bit complex, but I have tried to make the study uh, as comprehensive as possible. It's a, a textual interpretation, so it's based uh, fully on the interpretation of the, the binding provisions within the single convention and, and other treaties. Um, but then it goes to look for uh, support, to look for confirmation or information in a subsidiary means of interpretation, as can be other, other treaties uh, related, concluded by some or part of the parties, as could be the commentary, for instance, and obviously the, the work that led to the convention, such as the, the, the work of the plenipotentiaries and all the drafting history of the, of the treaty provisions at stake. So Article 4 on general obligations. Uh, as the board mentioned in the 2018 um, brief on the Bill C-45 of, of Canada legalizing non-medical cannabis. Uh, and I do agree, indeed, the, the way um, Bill C-45 has been crafted um, to legalize cannabis for non-medical and non-scientific purposes, this way cannot be reconciled with the obligations of Canada under Article 4, uh, Paragraph C of the Single Convention. And indeed, as uh, INCB mentioned in that same brief, Article 4, Paragraph C has this um, this wording. Um, however, I, I, I suggest that uh, we have not always given the, the, the proper attention to the, the, entire, the entirety of, of the general obligation contained in Article 4, because as we can see here, the INCB put emphasis on the fact that states have to limit exclusively to medical and scientific uses, purposes, a series of activities related to drugs, but this is subject to the provisions of uh, the single convention. So the limitation, the exclusive limitation is subject to the provision of the convention. This provision, we can find it in the text, but sometimes the commentary is just uh, making things easier. Indeed, the, 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 these, um, uh, these uh, provisions to which paragraph C is subject are three provisions which all apply to others and medical and scientific uses. It's Article 49 and Article 2, Paragraph 9, for what concerns cannabis. And then we have Article 27 for the coca leaf, but we're not considering it today. And these all concern others and medical and scientific uses, including for coca leaf, which is actually a flavoring agent, which is a non-medical use uh, flavor in uh, beverage. Um, so the, lim the limitation, what we have to understand is that the general obligation is not to limit exclusively, but to limit exclusively subject, subject to some exemptions. And this is why in the preamble, we don't find this uh, exclusive limitation, but just a limitation. The goal is to limit, not exclusively, uh, and a limit in a way that is generally acceptable. And that's, I think, absolutely fundamental to, to, to see this distinction of between the exclusive limitation balanced by the exemption and the generally acceptable uh, limitations that it, 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 is, it echoes in the preamble. Um, so the, the, in addition to this, we don't find any textual clear um, uh, obligation to prohibit in the convention. We just have recommendation or option to prohibit uh, schedule, uh, substances in Schedule 4 if certain conditions are given, but we never we will find an obligation to, to prohibit. So that's also an, an element to, to consider. It's just simply not there in the treaty, and if it's not there, it cannot bind us. And the object of purpose, finally, of the treaty, as the INCB recognizes itself, is 
the protection of the health and welfare of humankind. And to, to reach that goal, the, 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 the treaty and the parties proposes themselves to establish this uh, series of control measures in order to reach that goal of protecting the health and welfare. So the provision, the interpretation of the treaty has to be guided by this, by this goal. And it has, it has always been, uh, uh, even countries that say, we will, for instance, for substances in Schedule 4, we will apply prohibition. They do so because they, they believe in good faith that applying prohibition will contribute to improving and protecting the health and welfare um, of humankind. That's, uh, I think, something we can, we can, we can agree on, even, with those we, even if we don't agree with the fact that it will work, but we can agree that it's in good faith, their view of uh, reaching the goals of the treaty of protecting this uh, health and welfare. So, um, abuse is um, abuse, ill effects, addiction, misuse. We, we have a series of words that are analyzed in the, the, the report I am presenting, the high compliance, page 60, 66 to 73. The word abuse is uh, present, uh, so we have to note changes between the original single convention and the amended single convention. Initially, we had the word addiction present a lot. In high compliance, there is also an annex that uh, mentions that lists every single mention of the word abuse and related terms and explain their, their context. And what we find is that not only by the fact that abuse is here to replace addiction with the 1972 amendment, but also with the context in which it is uh, presented, abuse is um, a medical condition. It's um, a disease. It's um, certainly not uh, equivalent to uh, all uses or to all non-medical uses. Um, abuse is uh, uh, in the way that it is defined, but also in the way that it was defined at the time by the medical literature and the doctors, it, uh, it has evolved. And nowadays, uh, in the international nomenclature of diseases, where we used to find abuse, we now find substance use disorders. And in the 61 Convention, when we try to understand what abuse could mean just by reading the text, we see that it's always related to uh, ill effects, to conditions, uh, to the question of treatment and prevention. What do we treat and prevent? Uh, diseases, right? So in order to prevent the health and welfare of humankind, party have to avoid abuse, to avoid the substance use disorder and all other related harms. And that um, kind of makes sense. And so quickly, because I'm uh, short on time, but this is the way I, I try to, to represent graphically what was the convention um, establishes, so this closed loop, this limitation that we can see here in red. Um, so the licit uses for medical, uh, the licit medical uses uh, are these one in blue, the licit non-medical uses are the ones that are exempt under one of the three articles that Article 4C is subject to, uh, 29, 27 or 49. And finally, what is neither medical and scientific nor non-medical uh, as exempt under the relevant provision, that is the remaining uses that are illegal, uh, illicit, but not all non-medical uses are illicit. Um, and this cohered obviously with the object and purpose. So article two, paragraph nine is the current um, article that I identified in the, I'm not alone obviously, others have uh, identified this article as the one that provides a legal framework for non-medical cannabis in our current context in 2022. Um, uh, countries can, uh, as you see here, um, are not required to apply the provision of this convention to drugs commonly used in industry for other than medical and scientific purposes, as long as they ensure either by denaturing or other means that the drugs cannot be liable to substance use disorder to abuse. We also have this um, provision, this mention of uh, the harmful substances cannot be in practice recovered. And some people have said that this somehow forces into denaturing the substance because denaturing and uh, making the harmful substance not be recovered is somehow the same thing, or we can at least understand it as the same thing, but it's, um, it's not possible to have the same thing because if parties are given the choice of denaturing or something else, they cannot then be forced into denaturing in another provision that opposes the principle of uh, FAUT, the principle Utrecht Magis Valeat Comparet, which says that we cannot um, interpret a treaty provision in a way that it would render uh, parts of its word, parts of its, its provision, um, useless or void of, of any legal effect. So if we consider 
that the substance has to not in practice be recovered, meaning we have to remove the active compound or put other, um, other ingredients that would avoid the active compound to, to be used in the end. Uh, it's denaturing and the, then the words or by other means are void of any effect and that's not possible. We have to, these words have been inserted here on purpose and they must, they must have effects. So countries must be able to uh, um, not apply the provision of the convention uh, by applying other means than denaturing to these drugs. And this is to reduce uh, abuse the effects and uh, harmful uh, substances. So the, the only thing that makes sense and that does not render any part of the section void is by considering that harmful substances is harms. The harmful substance of the of the drug, the fact that it is harmful, the harmfulness of it. Um, in addition, if we try to uh, interpret, and again, that's uh, for the principle of uh, FAT, if we try to interpret that THC is the harmful substance in cannabis that should not be recovered. First, it's not that evident to think that it's easy to recover pure THC from cannabis. It's not easy. <laughs> That's why we have some, uh, some, some problems sometimes when people try to do it at home and they have accidents because it is not easy. Um, but anyway, if, even if we try to consider that it's easy, uh, if THC is a harmful substance that has to be re so the active ingredient of cannabis must be removed for the substance to be exempt, the provision has to work for all drugs. So wh what would it be for morphine when it's a single compound drug? Would we have to remove morphine from morphine in order for it to be exempt? That makes no sense. So if it cannot make sense for morphine, it cannot make sense for cannabis. That's again the principle of effectiveness. We would render the article 2.9 void in the case of morphine and not in the case of cannabis. In addition, we know that morphine has been given as an example of these drugs that can be exempted for processes of photography, which personally I, I would refer to as a recreational purpose, but that's, uh, that's uh, just a, let's say a private joke. Um, but uh, the, the morphine exempted for photography was not denaturated was not denatured. It was morphine because if it was not, it would not have been useful in these processes of photography. So again, Article 2.9 allows to, uh, according to the true general rule of interpretation, that is FAUT, this would have magis, valeam quamperat, allows to consider that either denaturing or other means are possible to, to uh, exempt uh, drugs as long as the goal of reducing abuse and this in order to contribute to the ultimate object of protecting the health and welfare uh, as long as this is met. Um, again, on Article 2, Paragraph 9, it's important to consider the intertemporal aspect of, of this article. Um, as the drafters uh, explained, uh, that it's also, we, we can see it in, in, in the treaty, but it's very clear in the, in the official records and also in the commentary. Article 2.9 was thought for the future, was made as something um, that uh, a, f a future condition which might never arise, which might or might not arise. And that's uh, well, elements of intertemporality, which allow um, uh, other elements of intertemporality are the fact that the drafters um, clearly balanced either we will include a flexible amendment procedure. Or if we don't, then we will include Article 2, Paragraph 9. It was one or the other. And the uh, drafters decided not to include uh, the amendment procedure, the flexible amendment procedure. And therefore, they decided to include Article 2, Paragraph 9. So these two uh, provisions had the same weight in terms of both their, them being thought for the future. An amendment is also something that we don't, we don't adopt a treaty to amend it the next year. We adopt it. The amendment is there for the future when there are developments that we, we, we cannot anticipate. And it's the same thing for Article 2, Paragraph 9, and that's called intertemporality. And in addition, by doing that, if they were not sure of including it and preferred the, or at some point prefer the amendment until they preferred Article 2, Paragraph 9, it's also because the language was vague, the harmful substances the commonly used in industry, all of this is not defined in the treaty. It's very vague and it could be interpreted in, in fairly different manners, including uh, in the manner that allows the legalization of cannabis. And even though the, the drafter might not have been just aware of just that as such, they were clearly aware that 
the drafting could have been improved, and that's Fran saying it at the uh, almost the last meeting uh, during the, the negotiation. But at the beginning of the negotiation, the USSR also mentioned that the language could be improved and that authors and medical and scientific use was very broad and industry as well. They knew that, but it's, they still decided to, to, to include it. And the intertemporality allows us to uh, look um, at um, the, the, the Article 2, Paragraph 9, with the terms of today instead of the terms of uh, 1961. That's quite interesting because obviously the cannabis industry, that is a term well used today, echoes uh, the common use in industry. And obviously we also mention a lot the non-medical use of cannabis as the standard term to refer to recreational use. So that echoes the non-medical use in, in the convention. But also the intertemporality allows to reconcile the provision of exemption for medical use under Article 2, Paragraph 9, with the provision of exemption for medical use under Article 49. It looks like they are exempting the same thing, that they are the same, and therefore they conflict. But this uh, is erroneous. They do not conflict because they have uh, tempor different temporal applications. Article 49 was thought for the part, not only they have different temporal uh, applications, but they also refer to different subtypes of authors and medical and scientific uses. Not only uh, they, um, so the medical uses that were, sorry, the non medical uses that were exempt under Article 49 uh, were the, those uses that were traditional in the territories and that were permitted as of. 1st January 1961. That's not the case of the uses under Article 2, Paragraph 9. These are only common in industry. So that's a difference in terms of subtypes of uses. And uh, Article 49 was made to expire after a, cert a certain period. So now there is some debate as to whether the period of expiration is that of the 61 convention or of the 61 convention as amended in 1962. The date would change, but anyway, in both cases, it's passed already, so Article 49 has expired. It is not applicable anymore. But then we have this intertemporal Article 2, Paragraph 9, which was thought to maybe apply in the future that we don't know of. And that's precisely why it is complementary with Article 49 once it has stopped to apply, once we have discontinued these uses that were traditional before 1st January 1961, then we can authorize new uses, the ones that are common in industry. So obviously there are, we can you know, discuss the content of we willing to prohibit or to discontinue traditional uses and allow only those that would be industrial. That's obviously uh, questionable, but still it's still uh, allowing uses for non-medical uses uh, legally after Article 49 uh, expired. And so uh, as of today, or as of at least if we consider that cannabis is common in industry, and uh, that uh, recreational use is non-medical use. Um, therefore, it's, if the country that considers that exempt um, or at least frames its legislation in a way that it complies with both paragraph, subparagraph A, reducing substance use disorder and other, other harms, and subparagraph B, um, submitting statistical information to the NCB, if the country complies with both, then the uses that are so exempted would be licit under the convention and obviously they will be undertaken under legal authority so in article 33 for instance where we see the possession of drug is not permitted except under legal authority and article 2 paragraph 9 provides that legal authority if we jump to the 1988 convention against trafficking it's the same thing with the 1988 convention never calls against the against cannabis generally they call against these activities that are already illicit under the 61 convention or contrary to the 61 convention. We can see this for instance, but it's all along the 88 convention um, in article three. Uh, we see it again in article 14. It's another example here. Uh, the 88 convention calls to eradicate illicit cultivation of, of cannabis and other narcotic plants, not the mere cultivation. And it is better that way because calling to eradicate any cultivation of cannabis would clearly go against the 1961 convention, which provides for its cultivation for not only um, medical and scientific purposes, but also uh, industrial and horticultural purposes. 
1971 convention as well, I have to mention it, but it's uh, clear I, I invite people interested to go look at footnote 105, 105 in, in the high compliance report. The footnotes uh, in this report are, as I said at the beginning, crafted to serve as a, as a toolkit and to provide uh, supporting information. So this footnote explains why the 1971 convention is not relevant, except if we talk about pure THC. And, uh, it's true that in high compliance, I'm not talking about pure THC, I'm talking about uh, the cannabis that people use for recreational purposes, which is rarely pure THC, it's rather uh, right cannabis or cannabis resin. So I, I don't really uh, address it, but uh, the 1971 convention do, would apply only in the case of that THC being pure isolated compound. Uh, as long as the THC is part of the cannabis plant, the cannabis, the cannabis resin, or part of the extract and tincture of cannabis, the 1971 convention um, has no effect, does not apply. And that's something that is obviously recognized by the INCB itself, in particular in its 2014 contribution to the high level review of the member states' uh, commitment to the political declaration plan of action and um, a number of other, other sources. And then, so to, to get back to, uh, to the beginning, Canada has legalized cannabis and said I am in non-compliance with the 1961 convention. It is true, it is true. But if they were to um, embed in their legislation harm reduction, uh, strong measures aimed at preventing, effectively preventing the harms and, and likelihood of abuse uh, from cannabis in their legislation and obviously in policy and be able to, in good faith, prove that they are doing so, and if they were reporting, uh, according to Article 2, uh, Paragraph 9, Subparagraph B, reporting to the NCB, they would uh, likely uh, be in compliance with Article 2, Paragraph 9. And by doing so, uh, they might be uh, in compliance with Article 4, uh, Subparagraph C. But obviously, if foreseen differently, as foreseen currently, they are not. And that's what is interesting. How should countries um, uh, consider these international dispositions when they are crafting uh, their law nationally and what kind of good faith commitment should they share with the international community in order to convince that they are um, still willing to uh, contribute to these goals of protecting the health and welfare of humankind, albeit maybe differently than other countries by regulating a particular use, but still they are contributing to this, this goal. And in addition, and just to finish, sorry if I was a bit long, but um, the Bill of Canada, the, the law could also have been forcing differently in order to uh, fit with the overreaching goal of the international community beyond the, the pure international law and drug control. There are also other obligations that relate to the question of, for instance, biodiversity of human rights, also under environmental concern. And obviously, the, the non-inclusion in, in many legally regulated cannabis markets, the lack of inclusion of the people that have been involved in illicit market. The fact that they are not included in the licit system uh, prevents, uh, to my opinion, and to the opinion of uh, a number of, of persons uh, interested in the topic, prevents a smooth and a comprehensive um, um, uh, uh, move towards a licit, a licit regulating system and continues to maintain part of the, the illicit markets uh, subsisting. So uh, comprehensive uh, social approaches that consider uh, the inclusion, the inco incorporation of these uh, stakeholders in the licit market is absolutely uh, essential and obviously it's not covered by the 61 convention, but that are elements that I thought should be uh, considered in, in the discussion today, questions of environment, social justice, biodiversity, and, and generally uh, uh, sustainable development. I thank you for your attention and I, I hope that I've not been too long.